Hi there, Thomas. I believe you've um, just published a, a brand new book. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Yes, here it is. It's called Forest Gardening in Practice. Uh, I spent four years doing that, um, and after the initial relief uh, when it came out, um, yeah, I'm quite pleased with the result now. And it's, yeah, it's making its way in the world. Uh, people are looking at it, commenting on it. And so, yeah, I think it was a worthwhile exercise. Oh, great. I guess there's a clue in the title, but could you tell us a little bit about what the book's about and what it covers? Um, so what it is, uh, it's, uh, it's a review of the first generation of forest gardens, really, which I was kind of surprised that that hadn't been done because... Uh, yeah, you get quite a few uh, books on how how to do a forest garden, why we're supposed to do it. Um, but what I was really interested in is what people were actually doing and how that worked out in practice and with people's real life situations where they've got jobs and families and um, want to go away and have like get older and iller and what have you. Uh, so. Just yeah, the real, real picture of it, and what what challenges people are facing in setting up these spaces, and how they deal with those challenges, and what the rest of us can learn from them. So that was kind of how I set what I set out to do, really. Okay, so you kind of answered my first question in uh, you know what were your aims and goals. Um, how did you kind of arrive at those, or how did you identify those goals? Well, you know, basically I've. I ended up writing the book that I wanted to read, you know, because I've been uh, spent um, many years being involved with forest gardening. Uh, like right from my permaculture course in '95, we went to see Robert Hart's place with Patrick Whitefield at the time. Um, so I was in, instantly hooked and intrigued, and then went to Holland to do some work with German people there, kind of setting up forest gardens. Um, and yeah, kind of kept going with in various places, mostly in this country. Um, and it was quite clear that kind of the um, ideas that Robert Hart had were, I mean, there was a lot of really useful and interesting stuff in there, but um, all the first for like the first forest gardens were by their very nature experimental. So, um, it's there's not you know many forest gardens that uh, for one reason or another didn't fulfill their potential in the long run even mm -hmm. when they started off quite promising you know and so um, I think there's a lot to learn from those early examples and there are some really fantastic ones that um, yeah kind of I think that are uh, as good as anything you could expect, you know, but uh, I think we can learn from those as well as from the ones, um, yeah, that went through all sorts of difficulties, you know, from those difficulties we can learn as well. Mm -hmm. um, in, and in terms of the book itself, what kind of information did you kind of need to gather beforehand? Before writing the book? Or yeah, before also around the research and what would be the survey stage of the um, um, design process? Well, being the... I've, I've been um, wondering what the design is actually here mm -hmm. uh, once because uh, uh, I was asked to write up how I wrote the book and then you asked me about this interview. So is the design about how I write the book or is the design actually the book? So in some ways you could say like uh, most of the work I've done over the four, far past four years mm -hmm. was the implementation phase of a very quick sketch design that came mm -hmm. together over um, over a few months, I'd say, uh, in conversation between myself and permanent publications. So it started off with a conversation over a cup of coffee with Tim Harland, uh, who was asking me, so what do you want to do next? Mm -hmm. And then before I knew it, I was... Uh, Describing this idea that I just described to you about mm -hmm. uh, basically this practice review of forest gardening, and uh, he was interested. So uh, the next step was for me to write down a two-page outline and um, 
just uh, very brief, uh, like almost like chapter headings of like what would be in this book. Um, that went back and forth a couple of times between myself and um, permanent publications, Tim and Muddy at that point. Um, then we, we also talked about like the layout, the aesthetics of the book um, and kind of what was important to me. And I mean, I identified some, the, the qualities really that I wanted the book to have as well as the content. So the qualities that were important to me were accessibility, so it was, uh, it had to be written in plain English rather than like lots of complicated Latin words, um, because I wanted it to be accessible to practitioners, to people who haven't got much uh, background in ecological theory necessarily, although I wanted to give some of that background, so there's a whole section in there on what is the underlying ideas in forest garden, in ecology, um, but in plain, plain English. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that was one, accessibility. Uh, there was, uh, at the same time, I wanted to have, it, uh, have certain rigor and depth of the research, so I needed to come up with a methodology that uh, allowed me to have that rigor and depth. Uh, and also, that meant I wanted to get it checked by uh, like the like some of the best people in their respective areas um, once I've written it and then the other aspect was the aesthetics because I've, one of my gripes about many of the early permaculture books is as it's just not enough pictures and mm -hmm. partly understandable because there weren't any living examples about but now that we have a lot of out there in the world examples I think that's no excuse for not producing something that's visually attractive and appealing and people just learn so much more from seeing some good pictures of a place rather than like endless text that uh, yeah, just gets like quite hard to absorb. Great. Yeah. And there's quite extensive interviews with um, mm -hmm. various individuals and projects in there. Um, yeah, I wonder if there was, you could tell us a little bit about how you went around, yeah. went about kind of the people side mm, of it, how you, uh, yeah. and how you approach that. So that was, I mean, what you see in the book is really just the tip of the iceberg of two years mm. of research. Uh, so I uh, started off by doing uh, research. I looked at uh, Martin Crawford's uh, Agroforestry Research Trust network. I looked at the Permaculture Lab Network. Uh, I also had a number of contacts already from the work I'd done over the years. So I had a bit of a shortlist in my head of the some promising projects I'd like to include, and a lot of them were the ones that kind of weren't so well known, so I decided there's no point me writing another essay on Martin Crawford's garden, because he can very well hold that um, for himself. Um, and so some of the like flagship projects, I thought, well, let's leave them aside and look at more sort of day-to-day -day and like the, the unsung stories. Um, I did a, a, a survey, an online survey, together with the Permaculture Association and Permanent Publications that went out throughout the temperate world, so North America, Britain, Europe. Um, it didn't really get uh, down into the Southern Hemisphere, but out of those I identified about 130 gardens, which then is a, not, is a big enough sample to start spotting patterns in terms of what settings are people working in, what scales. So the scale was quite uh, staggering from five square meters to 27 acres. Mm -hmm. you know, so, and, so, and people self-identify as forest gardeners, but is that actually the same thing? You know, so that was quite interesting. Um, so, so then out of those, uh, that big sample that I uh, gathered, I then made a short list of places to visit. Um, I ended up doing interviews with people in North America or in Europe, you know, that I couldn't visit in person. But in Britain, most of the places that are described, they, uh, I actually been there, went to, went to see them. Um, I th probably did interviews and uh, side visits of about 50 sites in the end. You know, there's a list at the back, kind of, that kind of like goes through it. And 
some of them I had to see twice because I couldn't get the right picture like <laughs> at, the wrong, at the wrong time of year or the weather was just not right or whatever. Um, or sometimes there was just follow-up questions to ask and sometimes mm -hmm. it was by Skype or uh, in some cases a new a second visit. Yeah. Okay. And um, would you say there was a conscious permaculture design process involved in actually producing the book? Um, there was definitely a lot of conscious thought and conscious uh, design going into it. Um, I'm thinking the bits of calling it a permaculture design process is a bit of a red herring, you know, mm -hmm. kind of, and, uh, in a way like this book, you know, kind of is, talks about uh, agroecological practice that is very uh, core, like polyculture, it's called core to permaculture, to a certain extent, who cares how the thing came into being if the product is right. Um, so that's not saying that I didn't uh, like go through a design process. But one interesting thing for me of uh, writing up the story of the book was that I um, realized a lot about like how I design and how this is quite a big project including like several designs of the survey, of the interview stage, of the layout of the book. I did, there's a whole design in there about how I got an illustrator and the illustra how we made the illustrations. Um, so there's a project with several designs in it, but it's also part of a bigger picture of what I'd call my research pathway. You know, so actually I've, so I've got a like about 10 years ago I said there's no permaculture research happening, I want to be part of making this happen and so this is part of, part of that and a result of that. I've also just, uh, that's, at the same time I've got a pathway about cooperative living and working which has all sorts of designs in it and some of them interfered with uh, the process of writing the book because I've got uh, a lot of other life going on and then there's my teaching pathway you know and so it's kind of I realized I can't have more than one pathway, I can have more than one project at the go at the same time, and the designs fit into one or several of those. Yeah. And my last question really, um, what do you feel your, your book brings to the wider world, you know, outside of the permaculture community? Well, I think it's, um, it, it opens a possibility of a discussion, you know, of, of conversation with uh, other disciplines, so I've been trying to aim it not just at home gardeners and permaculture enthusiasts. I talk a lot about how it fits into urban communities, what contribution it can make there. So um, I've been talking to landscape architects, to designers, to planners, you know, and um, I think if we want to get out of the permaculture bubble out of, uh, out of that little niche, then those are the sort of people or some of the people that we actually need to have conversations with and for that I think we, we need some uh, quality publications you know, that showcase some of the work, some of the excellent work we're doing. Yeah. Great, thank you very much. Thank you for your Great. time. Thank you.